Thank you. Um, the recent the recent financial services inquiry found that no single retirement income product comprehensively addressed the retirement income needs of uh, individuals. So what did the inquiry identify as these needs? They basically identified three key needs. The first need was the need for an income stream. The second need was the need for uh, risk protection and they identified three key risks, the first being longevity risk, the second being uh, inflation risk and the last being investment risk, so protection against those three types of risks. And then the third basic need that they identified was the need for flexibility. Um, given the inquiry found that no single product comprehensively addressed these needs, the inquiry recommended that uh, a comprehensive retirement income product be developed by um, product manufacturers to better meet these needs. Um, Given, given this challenge that the inquiry set down for the industry, David and I thought it would be a good idea if we could look at the issues facing retirees and look at that from a different perspective, and based on that different perspective, see whether there were some insights that we could provide ma product manufacturers so that they could better design retirement income products. So that's what we did, and that brings us to today's presentation. Basically, our presentation is uh, structured into three phases. Uh, the first phase looks at the needs of retirees. The second phase looks at the existing products in the marketplace. It looks at the products that have been successful and why, that, why the theories are as to why that's the case. It also looks at some products that are less successful and the theories as to why that's been the case. And then in the third phase of the presentation, we look at um, longevity problem in a little bit more detail and look at it from a different perspective. And out of that, we get some insights that we then apply to come up with some theoretical product designs that may, in, th in the future, may be attractive to retirees. So that's basically the structure of the presentation. I'll do the first phase and then David will do phases two and three. So what are the needs of retirees? Um, on this slide, I've outlined some of those needs. Um, the list isn't comprehensive. Um, if you want a more comprehensive list, I suggest you go to the paper that David and I drafted. It's on the, on the, in the Institute's website. Um, I won't go through each of those needs because they're all fairly self-explanatory. I suppose what I will do, however, is provide some insights on, on those um, basic needs. So I think the first insight I have is that some of the needs are pretty predictable in terms of their amount and timing. So for example, food is pretty predictable in terms of its amount and you need it every day naturally. Uh, some of the expenses are predictable in their amount but less predictable in their timing. So for example, sport, you know how much you're gonna spend on golf or lawn bowls or so forth but you don't know how long you'll be able to play that sport for. So as your health deteriorates, you're less able to, to participate in that, in that sport. So the timing of how long you'll be able to participate is, is less certain. And then you've got other needs on that list that are unpredictable in terms of both their timing and also their, their uh, amount. So for example, um, repairs to your house. You don't know when you're gonna have a problem with your house and you don't know how much it's going to be. So that's a, an, a, a need that's less predictable in terms of both the amount and timing. Another observation I'd make is some of those needs or a number of those needs are linked to the health of the individual. So for example, travel, transport, sport, entertainment, um, and various other ones are linked to the health of the individual. So when the person's healthy, they spend more on travel and um, and sport and, and entertainment and less on medical expenses. And then obviously, conversely, as your health deteriorates, you spend more on health and less on those other areas. So what does this mean from a product design perspective? Well, the, out, the, um, the uh, insight that we took away from it was essentially that um, some needs are best met through a regular income stream, while other needs may be better met through a lump sum or a series of lump sum payments, and David's going to talk about that in a bit more detail later. Um, in terms of um, the other area I wanted to briefly touch on is around longevity risk. So in terms of the paper, we looked at longevity risk as consisting essentially of two components. The first component being individual longevity risk and the second being portfolio longevity risk. 
So what do I mean by those two terms? Uh, individual longevity risk we defined in our paper as being the risk that someone lives longer than the population's expected, the, a the average expected <coughs> lifetime of people in the population. Um, and then in terms of portfolio longevity, we define that as the risk that the portfolio's longevity or expected lifetime of that portfolio is longer than anticipated through mortality improvements that are unexpected. So what does this mean from a product design perspective? Well, the key takeaway that we had was that the product manufacturer needs to decide whether they want to provide guarantees against individual longevity or portfolio longevity or the two types of longevity risk. Um, obviously, um, if the insurer decides to insure against um, one or both, that's going to have a pricing implication. So if you spend, if you, if you guarantee both risks, then that's going to have a higher price. It's also going to have more capital requirements. So that's a choice that the insurer needs to make. Um, the other area around longevity risk that we looked at was around quantifying longevity risk. So um, it's pretty well known in the Australian marketplace that longevity products have been unsuccessful. And that raises the question that, well, the obvious question of, is that a factor of the fact that uh, longevity risk is, is, is overstated in terms of its risk and its cost, or is it a function of the fact that people don't understand longevity risk? So we thought one way to try and answer that question was to try and quantify longevity risk to answer that question, but also to help us get a better understanding of longevity risk so that we could then use that information to design products. So that's what we did. Um, and the way we define longevity risk for the purposes of the paper was to calculate a ratio, and that ratio is the value of a deferred annuity divided by the value of a lifetime annuity. Now the deferred annuity that we put in our calculation is the value of a deferred annuity where the deferred period is equal to your life expectancy. And that's the ratio we use. Uh, this slide here is a graphical representation of it. It's not, I wouldn't say it's the best graphical <laughs> representation of it, but it is one anyway. So the deferred annuity is the cash flows in the circle, the green circle and the cash flows from the lifetime annuity are, is the red line. So that's basically how we've calculate, calculated our cost of longevity. Um, so what ratios do you calculate when you apply this ratio? Well, if you're age 65, we calculated a ratio of 13.7%. Uh, what does that mean? It basically means, or how do you interpret it? It basically means that if you've got a a million dollars of assets, you need to set aside 13.7% of your assets to, to, to pay for longevity pr protection, or well, that's what you should be if you want to provide protection against it. Um, uh, uh, the second observation I'd make is that obviously um, our calculation is approximate in nature. We've made a number of simplif simplifications, so these numbers here are only very approximate. So some of the simplifications we made was that we didn't allow for mortality improvements and we didn't allow for selection effects and I think we didn't allow for a, uh, we assumed a flat yield curve. So there's a number of approximations there which obviously impact the ratios we've calculated but we think the insights that the table provide are still legitimate. Um, one of the observations that you can quite clearly see there is that the cost of longevity changes with age under our formula and increases with age. Um, another observation I'll make is trying to interpret the 13, or, or understand the drivers behind the 13.7% for someone that's age 65 and is a male. So when you look at our formula and you try and understand the drivers, there's basically three drivers that drive that that percentage. The first driver is a probability factor and it's basically the probability of, uh, of someone surviving to their life expectancy. So that's 0.5. The second factor is a, a PV factor. So that's the, the, a PV factor that looks at um, your current age and then your life expectancy and it's a PV over your life expectancy. So for someone that's 65, it's a PV factor based on 19 years. So that's the second factor. And then the third factor is a ratio. It's, um, 
It's a ratio of an annuity based on someone that's at their life expectancy divided by an annuity or lifetime annuity that is for someone at their current age. So if you're 65, it's the ratio of your lifetime annuity at age 83 divided by your lifetime annuity at age 65. So for someone that's 65, that ratio is around 0.5. So if you multiply those ratios together, you get the longevity cost. So for someone that's age 65, that's 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, which gives you roughly the 13.7%. Uh, um, the last observation I'll make is that when you look at those drivers, the PV factor approaches one as you get older. And the ratio that I talked about, that annuity ratio, also approaches one as you get older. So that's why you're seeing the longevity cost increase with age. Um, so what's the implication that I took from, from, from these findings in terms of designing annuity products? Well, I suppose the implication that I took was that longevity cost is a significant cost. And therefore, my theory as to why longevity products haven't been successful is more, it appears to be more related around the design of the products and the communication of those issues as opposed to the fact that longevity risk isn't important. So in terms of that, David's gonna talk more about how you look at longevity risk and how you can design some products. And he's also gonna talk about some of the existing products on the marketplace at the moment and why some have been successful and why others haven't been. So I'll hand over to David now. Okay. Now, this um, first slide you will have seen is, is not that dissimilar to the slide that was shown in the last plenary session. So we looked at um, some of the existing products and some of the features um, that resulted from those products. So we looked at lifetime annuities, we looked at fixed term annuities, we looked at deferred annuities with profit annuities, Etc. Etc. Um, so we looked at all those products and looked at the features um, as, as to whether they um, provided longevity protection or didn't, and, and so forth. So some of the features we looked at, um, as I said, were longevity protection. So some of the products uh, provide longevity protection, uh, like the annuity, the the um, lifetime annuities, whereas some don't the um, account-based pension and the fixed-term annuities, for example. And some, as Martin uh, alluded to, some provide um, both protection against uh, individual longevity and portfolio longevity. So the traditional annuities um, tend to provide protection against both, but some only provide protection against individual longevity. So, for example, the with profits annuities, um, they provide protection against the, the chance that you live longer than the rest of the pool, but the, actual, the, the, the prospect that the pool lives longer, well, that just decreases um, the amount of bonus that you get. So there is no protection uh, provided in, in regard to that. The second thing is regard, in relation to flexible payments. So some uh, of the products provide a, a fixed level of payment every year thereafter, whereas some you can vary the amount of payment uh, within certain uh, bands and certain rules and certain limits. Some provide uh, investment choice. The, uh, individual can, the individual retiree can choose um, what they invest in. Others don't provide investment in choice. It, it's basically left up to the insurer uh, to choose or somebody else to choose uh, what the investment choice is. Some provide protection against uh, market risk and some don't. By market risk, I mean the, the, the possibility that the market might fluctuate and you might uh, be stuck with um, an investment which falls in value. Or you might actually be exposed, depending on the timing of when you actually buy the product, you might buy the product just after the market falls and so you don't therefore have um, as much money as you uh, initially thought. Forfeiture is uh, a big issue. Um, in theory, um, some would say it's, it's not necessarily um, 
consistent with the purpose of superannuation to provide um, a retirement income. Uh, forfeiture basically me, uh, is, is along the lines of having some pool left over uh, to provide for your, you know, to, your to leave to your dependents um, if you die. And some would say that that isn't uh, uh, what superannuation is about. Nevertheless, um, a lot of people think that way, and the fact that um, there is high forfeiture under some products uh, tends to uh, turn people off. Martin mentioned the capital requirements. The longer and stronger that a guarantee is, the higher the capital requirements uh, potentially are. So he mentioned, for example, uh, individual and, and portfolio, um, portfolio longevity. Um, if you only provide protection against individual longevity, then the amount of guarantee that you provide will be less than if you cover both, and therefore the capital requirements would be, um, would be less. And lastly, uh, the CIS regulations. The CIS regulations currently do not necessarily uh, allow certain products um, to be issued by insurers. That might change come um, July 2nd, but we'll, we'll see what the story is. So this mentions, um, and various papers have previously described uh, some problems with the existing uh, longevity products, particularly annuities, and, and why they perhaps uh, aren't popular and, and don't sell. Uh, so just quickly, um, so some uh, products are more complex uh, and, and than individual retirees could understand. They're perceived to have a higher cost than, uh, than, than doing it yourself. They're perceived as being uh, inflexible. They provide, uh, a lot of retirees actually view their retirement savings as a kind of investment rather than an income in retirement. And, and they, therefore they don't like the idea that part of their investment might be forfeited um, if they die. As I mentioned before, a number of retirees want to leave an inheritance when they die to their kids. Uh, they particularly want to control the investment strategy. They don't like the idea that other people uh, control the investment uh, strategy. Coupled with that, they have uh, a degree of self-reliance and self-confidence. We can see that um, in the popularity of SMSFs. Um, where the individual has greater control um, than with um, an industry fund or, or some other type of fund. A lot of um, retirees value consumption now more than the future. They, they, um, they uh, have what's, what's called a hyperbolic discounting... Hyperbolic, the right word? Yeah. Um, discounting function. So they, t they, they put a lot of value on what's going to happen now in the next couple of years and put very little value on what's going to happen a long time in the future. And therefore they, they see longevity as a problem, oh, it's going to happen out there. So let's not, let's not worry about it. Let's concentrate on and give more emphasis to what's going to happen uh, now. Um, I mentioned on that slide tax treatment, actually the existing products, um, they're probably um, fairly well uh, tax treated. But one of the things that, that has been found is that tax is a very big motivator for people. And if a, if a contract isn't tax, taxed concessionally, then people will say, oh, gee, I'd rather go with something else that, that, that is tax concessionally. Um, thankfully, a lot of the, um, the, the current products are taxed uh, concessionally. They don't like potential regret. They don't like having, feeling like they've made a mistake. Um, they don't like the, the idea that they might die and uh, they're not going to uh, be able to, to utilise um, all of their retirement income and uh, superannuation savings. In a number of uh, jurisdictions, the product is the default. So you're required to uh, buy a particular uh, uh, longevity protected product. And people tend to do that. If it's not the default, then people uh, tend not to, to buy that product. 
A lot of retirees see the aged pension or the family home as adequate and therefore they underestimate their actual needs in retirement. And lastly, um, it would be good, although we don't like, like saying this obviously, um, but it would be good if the advisor could be involved more often. Um, the advisor tends to uh, recommend products where they're likely to be involved and give advice more frequently than, if, than, than other, other products. If, if they're in, involved only at the beginning or if they're not involved at all, um, the advisors won't tend to recommend those products. Now, one of the, uh, the things that we're looking at, and one of the things that, that has been noticeable in the market is that what, what happens with a lot of the existing products is that the income that's provided in retirement actually comes from um, this product. Um, what we're suggesting here is that maybe the income could be provided by the account-based pension and longevity protection could be provided by something else. And the account-based pension actually has done fairly well. Um, in contrast to, to uh, some of the other products, um, it's seen as simple. Uh, people are familiar with it because it's, it's basically the same. What you have post-retirement is pretty much the same as what you had pre-retirement. Um, people see it as cheap um, you, you, or cheaper than the alternatives. You, you have the uh, initial uh, investment charges and the administra administration charges, but other than that, um, you don't have a lot of the charges that, might, that other products might have. It tends to be flexible, um, and inheritance can be left. Retirees can do their own investment rather than leaving it to somebody else. And as such, it uh, fosters a, a degree of self-reliance and self-confidence. People feel they have value for money. It's treated tax concessionally. Um, they don't necessarily feel the same level of regret that they might do with other, other products, and the advisor has more of a role um, with the ABP than uh, might be the case with other products. So, what we're suggesting here is a different approach. So, rather than provide retirement income and out of the actual retirement income product, the idea here is to provide retirement income out of the account-based pension and then have something else which tops up the account-based pension. One of the things that um, many people assume, particularly with, with the, uh, existing products, is that longevity is, is a long-term problem. But if you think about it, longevity is actually to survive. Longevity basically depends on you surviving for a long time. But to survive for a long time, you actually have to survive for the first period, and the second period, and the next period, and the next period. So surviving for a long period is actually made up of surviving for a number of uh, short periods. And that's the, um, the idea um, of the living bonus um, under certain investment uh, products that, that are out there, um, that if you survive a particularly short period, then you get a uh, bonus, and if you survive another short period, you get another bonus and so forth. Well, this, this is similar, but instead of it being an investment option, the idea is to have an insurance alternative rather than an investment option. Now, one of the, uh, the, the criticisms of an insurance option has been what is the, the, uh, the benefit? And the purpose of this graph and the associated section in the paper is basically to say that this problem was actually looked at and solved a number of years ago. So people might think that there is uh, a problem of how do you actually define the benefit amount, but it was actually solved a number of years ago in a paper by Dakin. Um, I think that the title of the paper was annuities and, and, and so forth. I can't, I can't remember the exact title. The exact title is in, is in the paper. But he referred to this concept of mortality drag. And this graph shows basically the um, mortality drag, which is the, uh, the blue line, and the benefit that would be needed um, to compensate for mortality drag. And the red line is basically the benefit that would be provided, the top up 
that would be provided under an insurance option. Now, they look fairly similar, their, their shape is fairly similar, but actually um, the scale is different. The blue one is actually on the left-hand scale and the red one is on the right-hand scale. So initially, the, uh, the amounts are uh, pretty much the same, but as you get to very high ages, they're actually quite different in, in amount because the blue line, if you measure it on, on the, the, the left-hand scale, is quite different to the amount of the, uh, the red line on the right-hand scale. Now, that difference is basically a matter of timing. So once measured, mortality drag is measured at the beginning of the period for everybody, and the compensation is at the end of the period for those who survive. So the difference is basically a 1 plus i factor, a discount factor, and a survivorship factor. And, and the, the reason for the, the difference at the higher ages is simply because 1 minus q gets considerably less than 1 at the higher ages. At the lower ages, it's pretty much 1 regardless. But at the higher ages, it's a lot different from 1. So this, uh, this slide gives the actual formula um, for the benefit. So the benefit is basically a Q over 1 minus Q um, times the account balance. So you can basically project or estimate um, what the account balance will be at the end of the, end of the period. So it's basically the account balance at the start of the period less the income that you um, derive immediately. And therefore you can ensure the amount of the benefit. You can d define what the benefit will be um, for that um, for that. And then you can fund that benefit um, in two ways. One is via a premium payable by everybody at the start, and the formula for that is given, or you could fund it by forfeiture from those who die. And actually, the amount that you get from a premium payable by everybody versus an amount that you get by forfeiture from those who die is actually about the same. Because the, uh, the number who die would be a QX type factor. So the forfeiture is QX times AB minus 1, and the premium is QX times AB minus 1. So they're basically the same. Now, one of the things we found, and one of the problems we found, was that um, if you, at the, the young ages particularly, and if you do this just one year at a time, the premium that might be required is not that different from the benefit. So they're fairly close. And the, so there's not a lot of margin in, in, to provide um, expenses and profitability uh, and so forth. So that's one of the issues that, that we need to consider. And, and we've looked at a number of ways that that can be solved. Um, so there is the, the premium versus the benefit. There is the amount that can be, should be funded by a premium versus the amount that should be funded by forfeiture. There is the frequency of the benefit. So should the benefit just be payable after, on survivorship after one year or should it be uh, payable on survivorship for a number of years. And how frequently um, should advice be provided by the financial advisor? And to the extent that you have uh, greater optionality under the product, then obviously there's a greater role for the financial advisor to give his advice and his recommendation on which way um, a retiree should, uh, should go as far as those um, issues are concerned. This also um, raised the issue of anti-selection. Um, anti-selection, particularly if you um, have forfeiture, anti-selection basically depends on, if you, if you know you're going to die, then why take or keep the product? Um, if you know, particularly if, if um, a large amount is going to be forfeited, obviously you don't want to, uh, to keep the product if you know you're going to die. Um, and, but even if, the, if you don't have forfeiture, um, there is still a degree of anti-selection because why continue with um, a level of insurance that you don't actually need, again, if you, if you know you're going to die. So to limit anti-selection, there's going to ne necessarily need to be some rules and some restrictions um, around the price. And that lessens the degree of flexibility uh, that a product might, be, might provide. So you need a, a balance uh, between the two. And some uh, potential options that, uh, for addressing uh, anti-selection, 
might be extending the length um, of the, the, the period of the ben between benefits or perhaps applying a ben penalty or underwriting um, if the retiree cancels or reduces um, their cover. So we've looked at a number of designs. This, this slide mentions two possible designs um, that we've looked at. Um, the first is basically a deferred annuity style product, but instead of providing an income if you survive um, for a particular period and then providing an income thereafter, for each year um, thereafter, it but just provides a lump sum on survivorship um, for that period. So instead of providing annuity, it just provides a lump sum. Now, there's nothing to stop um, the retiree from then purchasing annuity at then current rates, but they've got a degree of flexibility because um, between now and when the uh, deferred annuity actually matures, their circumstances might well have changed. So they might not need a deferred annuity at that stage. So they're free uh, to choose um, what they do. And the, the, the second option um, is basically a product which provides an annual top-up, um, as I described, to the account-based pension, um, but it's basically, it's largely funded by forfeiture um, to address that issue um, that I mentioned about the benefit and the premium basically being the same. Because um, it's largely funded by forfeiture, the, the amount of premium is a lot lower um, and so for there, therefore there is uh, a degree of margin. This um, graph isn't actually in the paper, but it provides a kind of example of, a stylized example of what I'm on about. So the green line is the account-based pension. You can see that it, it decreases over time, but it do, importantly, it doesn't run out because it's constantly being topped up. The dark blue line is the amount of retirement income uh, that you get, and that's pretty much um, level out, out of the product. And the, the light blue line is the amount of top-up that uh, that's needed each year. The slight downturn at the end, it's a bit of a quirk of the, um, of the mortality assumptions that we used in producing the graph. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. So imagine that the light blue line basically increases with age and the dark blue line's basically level. Okay. So um, in conclusion, as I said, um, the existing products are mostly um, concentrated on the provision of income, and what we're suggesting is that there might be an alternative way of providing that income via the ABP and then using something else to top up uh, the ABP if a person survives. And particularly longevity is not necessarily, as a lot of people think, one long um, thing, but it's made up of survivorship over a number of short, uh, short periods. Uh, and uh, we've suggested a couple of alternatives um, that might be uh, possible uh, in, that, in that space. The, um, the, the main thing that needs to be remembered is that no single product solution um, is appropriate in all circumstances. circumstances. We are all indiv uh, unique individuals, we all have unique uh, needs, and we need to uh, cater for that in the products that we provide. Okay.